What's up, everybody? Thanks, as always, for supporting the show. It would mean a lot to me if you would take a second to scroll down and hit that subscribe button to the Hoops Tonight YouTube channel, and then follow me on social media on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter so you guys don't miss any of our content over the course of this season. All right, let's talk some basketball. The biggest story surrounding the Lakers this past week was Austin Reeves being moved to the bench, a move that I thought, you know, was at least the motivation behind it made sense in the sense that like the Lakers starting lineup was struggling consistently and the backcourt in particular was a driving force behind those struggles. But the, 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 the team is kind of pitching it as like, he's our man who Ginobili shout out to uh, Logan Swain, head of content here at the volume. You basically coined that term. Uh, uh, but like the, uh, a, it's being portrayed as essentially this big picture San Antonio Spurs. We're going to empower him the way we did Manu kind of thing. But what have you heard behind the scenes behind like the reasoning behind moving Austin, whether or not it's a permanent thing or a temporary thing and just how he and some other people in the locker might've reacted to that change. Yeah. Well, uh, I was very surprised by it. And in speaking with people around the team, uh, a lot of people were surprised by it. Uh, it seems like it was a decision uh, that Darvin Ham kind of kept close to the vest and, and really uh, tight within his coaching staff. And uh, he made the decision after the Houston game, uh, go, you know, as they were heading over to Phoenix, uh, you know, met with Chris Gent, uh, one of his lead assistants, and they kind of talked it through, uh, came to that decision. And then he and Austin met up uh, in Phoenix uh, at the hotel uh, had about a 30 minute conversation and kind of talk through it. And I, I think the Lakers, if you look at it now, like the L Lakers are kind of doing a half measure where they clearly had to split up D'Angelo Russell and Austin Reeves. That backcourt just was not working. If you look at all the lineup data and, and just the eye tests, like those two guys have such similar strengths and weaknesses. And, and, you know, I think a lot of the problems that they were having defensively and on the defensive glass in particular, uh, kind of stemmed from just having Austin and D'Lo out there and, and those guys not really being able to, uh, you know, hit guys in the paint or, or, or rotate the prop, you know, rotate properly or whatnot. So I think they, they had to split that backcourt up, but it's kind of a half measure in my opinion, just because you, if you look at it, D'Lo has been starting games, but Austin's been closing. And to me, it's like you're trying to keep both sides happy where you're like, okay, D'Lo has been a starter his entire career. We're going to keep him in the starting group. Uh, Austin, you're going to come off the bench, but now you're going to close game. So in the Phoenix game, Austin played the entirety of the fourth quarter. D'Lo didn't play. Then in the Portland game, Austin checked in at the five minute mark for D'Lo. D'Lo sat the rest of that. So on the one hand, you're, you're still seeing that you know actions speak louder than words and the Lakers are saying we trust Austin running the offense in crunch time more than we trust D'Lo. And that kind of shows their commitment and confidence to Austin. But to me, it's it's still like, if you had to split them up, I would go with the guy who's better, who, who's your third best player, who's been better over the entirety of, of kind of this tandem together, who is better in the playoffs, who Darvin Ham said is a future all-star. Like, I, I just don't really see trying to split it up this way where you're trying to keep D'Lo happy by keeping him the starter, but it's almost kind of this token starter position where when it comes down to crunch time, you're going to still split them up and, and you're going to lean towards Austin. So I think, you know, also from talking to people, uh, there, there's a sense that Austin would take a benching better than D'Lo would. And, and that, you know, this was a concern the Lakers had uh, in the Western conference finals against Denver, where D'Lo was kind of unplayable uh, on both sides of the ball and it took till game four for them to really feel comfortable benching him and just saying, hey, like this is our last resort. If he doesn't take it well, we're about to get swept anyway. So uh, I think that was another sense, too, was that Austin's a good soldier. He, he you know, he stayed professional throughout uh, discussing the, the demotion. I know they're calling it a realignment. I'm, I'm calling it a demotion. And, uh, you know, so I think that was another sense, too, was. D'Lo has been playing slightly better. I think that gap is shrinking, uh, but it was also kind of politically trying to figure out how can we keep both sides happy. And so far it's been D'Lo starting and Austin closing. Yeah, I, I, I think that that's what's so funny about the Manu Ginobili thing is like the important context to why Manu Ginobili came off the bench was Tony Parker was a better player than him. Like that, Tony Parker was second team All NBA. Tony Parker was a guy that was you know uh, um, essentially just a, a better option in the starting lineup than Austin Reeves was. Now, I think there's 
there's it's 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 important to acknowledge that that's probably the reason that Austin's younger doesn't have his you know obviously doesn't have the pedigree that D'Angelo Russell did coming out of college. Obviously, he was this you know big time scorer out of Ohio State. He was a lottery pick. It's a totally different vibe in terms of um, their kind of like ego that they're bringing into the situation, right? And I think that that obviously is going to naturally make Austin kind of an easier target there, for lack of a better term. Now. I do think that there's. it's important to acknowledge why this isn't working because more or less, these two guys were the backcourt last year and it didn't seem like a problem until they ran into that Denver matchup. And, you know, you and I talked about this after media day and I think it's it's safe to say that the D'Lo Austin backcourt was destined to be broken up at the deadline because of that Denver series and the realities of the the limitations of those two as a top tier like playoff duo in the backcourt. But they should have been fine in the regular season. And so let's like there's a reason why it hasn't been working out. And I think I think a big part of it is like Austin hasn't been as good defensively as he was last year. Now mm-hmm. there's there's context there like he's in general been in a little bit of a funk to start the season he had a really long off season with a lot of mileage on his legs and and maybe it's one of those things where like as the season progresses he'll get back into better shape um but he hasn't been as good he hasn't been as good on the glass um he hasn't been as good at the point of attack he hasn't been as good in his rotations he just hasn't been as good as he was last year now i don't think basketball players just magically get bad at basketball overnight like that i think he's just dealing with some stuff and he will be fine but that duo won't be able to play together in the regular season until you know the two of them kind of start holding up better there I do think Vanderbilt coming back helps a lot in the sense that he kind of takes on a lot of the dirty work responsibilities that you expect from the backcourt he is a primary point of attack guy excellent defensive rebounder in a way that Torian Prince is not so that's the next question here when Vando comes back do you think Austin goes back into the starting lineup at that point? Or do you think they slot Torian Prince at the two? What do, what do you think is going to be the look when uh, when Vando comes back? My understanding is it's TBD right now. I think the Lakers are still in, in evaluation period with how they view Austin coming off the bench versus starting. Uh, I do expect Vando to go back into the starting group. I think he'll start over either... Cam or Torian, which is kind of a crazy statement to make with, with the the way that Cam has come on the, these last two games in particular. But I, I think it's been about three or four games now that he started to play better, uh, even if his shot hasn't been reliable. Uh, but I, I so right now I would peg it as D'Lo, probably Torian, uh, Vando, LeBron, and AD uh, as the projected starting lineup once Vando is back. But a lot of things could change. Like I think Torian hasn't shot the ball well. He's shooting 31.4% on threes this season. Uh, that was a guy that coming in what was a near 40% uh, career three-point shooter. So if he continues to struggle, I, I think he probably has to move to the bench. Uh, and, and then, you know, who knows? May, maybe Vando is the guy that, um, you know, I was talking to someone this morning and they were saying maybe Vando is that the the, the kind of the bridge to making the Austin uh, D'Lo backcourt work again, where he handles the top perimeter assignments. He gives you that energy and athleticism and length in the front court. Uh, you know, a good defensive rebounder and just someone who, I mean, we, we saw it work in the regular season where that five sum was really good together. And, and I, I think they're about uh, plus 10 or, or plus 11 points uh, per hundred possessions uh, off the top of my head. So I think Vando. I mean, again, we'll we'll see when he returns. We'll, we'll see how guys are playing uh, uh, up until that point. But uh, I mean, so far the Lakers are two and zero with Austin coming off the bench. I, I think he has played well in that role. Cam has played well in the starting group. Uh, but I, I think longer term and, and just big picture, as you were hinting at, if D'Angelo Russell isn't here past the trade deadline, then this is all kind of for naught. Where now you're going to have to. I mean, I assume if you're trading D'Lo, you're probably moving Austin back into the starting lineup. So it's like. I mean, Austin is the guy who's signed for three more seasons. Uh, He's going to be here past the trade deadline uh, in in LA. Like, I I just, I think it's a mistake benching him personally. Um, I I just, I understand the logic behind it, but but I disagree with it. And I know several people within the team disagree with it. And I, I don't know. I I think they're an interesting spot with it, but I I think Vando is going to go back to starting and it comes down to probably Torian or Cam uh, for the fifth starter as of right now. I've kind of liked the big looks in general uh, when Torian's been at the two or Cam Reddish has been Mm -hmm. at the two. I think in the big picture, that's kind of what the team looks like is basically 
Torian at the two plus whatever player they get back for D'Lo or maybe Torian at the three with whatever player they get back from D'Lo if it's a guard. But like that, that kind of to me, I, I mentioned this to you um, in a text message the other day, and I, I think it's the truth. But like when you look at this Austin situation, when you look at in general, just the way that the, the starting lineup has looked, when you go back to the Denver Nuggets series, we kind of said this on media day, but I feel more certain about it now. I think D'Angelo Russell getting traded is one of the safest bets in the NBA this season. It's a simple question of like, if you can't play him alongside your third best player in the backcourt and you have to bring him off the bench. And if you look at the lineup data and it's like whenever one of them's on, but the other's off is literally when the team has been playing at their best. Like, and that goes for both of them. Even the D low led units without Austin have been really good. So like, it's pretty clear that that's the direction that they're going. In the NBA, the game can change in an instant, but no matter how the action unfolds, DraftKings Sportsbook has your back. This week, new customers can score 150 instantly in bonus bets just for betting five bucks on basketball. Win or lose, you get an instant dub. They even have great same game parlays. Like in the Celtics-Knicks game, you can get the Celtics money line, Tatum over 26 and a half points, Jalen Brown over 22 and a half points. That's at plus 258 odds in the Bucks-Bulls game. You can get Bucks money line, Giannis over 28 and a half points and Dame over five and a half assists at plus 252 odds. So many different ways to bet the NBA. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code HOOPS. That's H-O-O-P-S. New customers can get 150 instantly in bonus bets for betting just $5 on basketball. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code HOOPS. The crown is yours. For a limited time, Verizon customers can get Netflix and NFL Plus for just $25 a month. It's called Plus Play. That's $120 in annual savings. Plus Play is a platform where Verizon customers can shop, manage, and save on the subscriptions that you already love, right? Like Netflix and NFL Plus. With NFL Plus Premium, you get access to live games on mobile, my fave, NFL Red Zone, NFL Network and more. Just go to verizon.com slash plus play. Verizon.com slash plus play to save on Netflix and NFL Plus today for a limited time only now. Limited time only. I guess my question for you is, it does. Have you heard anything coming from the Laker front office that they are as aware of this issue and that they also see that as the inevitable destination? And if so, do you know what archetype of player that they're looking at? Are they looking for like big fish? And we saw that report come out the other day that the Lakers might be looking at a star. Or do you think they're looking at more a higher quality role player upgrade for that two, two or three spot? So it's been pretty quiet on the trade front. I think since the beginning of camp, um, but when they re-signed D'Lo and, and it came out that uh, he had declined his, his basically his no trade clause, it, you know, part of a little CBA wrinkle uh, when you sign a one plus one uh, with a player option, you, you traditionally get a no trade clause for uh, you know that first year, and with the new CBA, they they tweaked it uh, where. You know, you could decline that. And I think the Lakers and D'Lo kind of came to an agreement of we're going to give you more than you could get on the open market uh, because I don't think he had much of a market th- this offseason. And had he left the Lakers, he probably would have had to sign for the full uh, mid-level exception, which would have been about $12, 12 million starting out. Uh, so Lakers decided, hey, we're going to give you some more money. We're going to give you 17 and a half uh, over two years or you know, 17 and a half annually over two years. And then you're going to waive this so we can trade you at the trade deadline uh, if we find the right move. So I don't think they're fully committed to trading D'Lo. I think there is a scenario in which uh, they figure this out. It works really well and uh, they just decide to ride it. And like I, I think really it, you, this was an opportunity for them to move him to a bench role potentially where it could have just been like Austin's the starting point guard, D'Lo's the sixth man. And th- I think that would kind of make more sense in a playoff setting where if you're playing Denver and you have D'Lo coming off the bench, like he can play 12 to 15 minutes if he's not playing that well, but it- it's harder to do that if he's the starter and Austin is coming off the bench. So um, I, I, again, I, I, that's where I, I don't really, I feel like there's a, 
b- bit of a cognitive dissonance there with, with the benching of Austin w- when it feels like a temporary measure. Uh, but in terms of guys that they're looking at, I think the Kyrie rumor is going to pop up again come trade deadline. Now, Dallas is off to a great start. They're eight and two. So I don't see why they would trade Kyrie. Um, yeah, you know, and that probably looks like something like D'Lo and, and Rui and a pick for Kyrie. And I don't know, like, I don't see why Dallas does that right now unless they start struggling. And then I think there's going to be a Chicago fire sale. So, uh, you know, Alex Caruso is obviously a, a Laker favorite, uh, but Zach Levine, DeMar DeRozan, those have been two guys the Lakers have been interested, uh, have been interested in for several seasons now. Uh, you know, DeMar even going back to the Toronto days, but, but also in San Antonio. So I, I look at those maybe one of those three uh, as a target for LA come the trade deadline or maybe sooner, uh, depending on when Chicago decides to blow it up. So I think Kyrie will come up again, depending on what happens with Dallas. But I think if Chicago has a fire sale, I think the Lakers are going to be calling them and and trying to get in that mix. Yeah. It's a way different set of circumstances because last year it was like they needed to make a trade just to be competent in the regular season. And like the Russell Westbrook situation was tenuous. There was bad body language. There was, you know, all of these like Zapruder film type things where like people's like, oh, look, Russ <laughs> gave a weird look to LeBron across the arena or whatever, you know, or like that well, sort of thing. Well, some really good and say hi to each other. Ex- exactly. And, and so, and then there was that weird clip the other day where before the tip off of the Clippers game, he was kind of like avoiding the hello handshakes at the, at the start. Yeah. And like, that's the thing, like it was just a totally different vibe. And, and that's the thing, it, you, like the Lakers are not a bad team right now. Um, in the big picture of the of this of this regular season, so it's not like oh my gosh they need to make a trade they need to make a trade. It's just it's inevitable that they're going to like there are three teams this year that I look at as really high probabilities to make a trade even though they're already good, like the Lakers. I think the Milwaukee Bucks same type of thing need to upgrade that two spot in some way shape or form into a rotation level like starting level defensive rebounding guard right. And then the Philadelphia 76ers, I think they know they're a good regular season team, but I think they know they probably need one upgrade if they're going to have any chance of contending with the with the Bucks and the Celtics in the big picture in the playoffs because of the inevitable playoff shortcomings that Joel Embiid has, right? So it's important to, to differentiate here. Jovan and I are not saying like the Lakers need to make some big trade because it's like no. the, all hell is breaking loose. This is just big picture playoff ceiling stuff. I think... The uh, the Caruso DeRozan package is one that I find interesting. You know, I really like Rui Hachimura, but he kind of falls into a similar space with D'Lo where like there's some issues with specific playoff matchups where it's like because Rui basically plays the same position as LeBron, there are certain matchups where you're like, oh man, we really need him. Memphis and Denver, right? And then there's another matchup against Golden State where you're like, oh, we can't really use him in this series. You know what I mean? And th- that that kind of in- inherently makes him somebody that you start to look at is if the target package required more salary filler, you'd probably consider him there, even though he's a great player. The other guy I was looking at was Dorian Finney-Smith with the Brooklyn Nets. I like him as an option that you could get without having to include Rui Hachimura that basically brings in a a, a, a good catch and shoot player that can guard at the point of attack, just basically like a better version of Torian Prince at the three that you can go to in, in those specific situations. But I do think, I do think it's going to happen. It's just a question of what they intend to go after it. And I think going after a star would be a huge mistake. I think LeBron looks great. I think that um, the late game offense has been excellent. I, I don't see the need for a star more than I see the need for just upgrades at very specific position groups with the role players. 